Okay, so we'll go back to another video. So here we'd like to go into a more in-depth analysis on how the Riemann zeta of 4 is equal to pi to the power of 4 divided by 90. So recall from a past video that I worked on that was an improper integral from 0 to infinity of 4 times the floor x divided by x to the power of 5 dx. Um, in that segment of the video, nearly towards the end, we've come to the conclusion that it actually comes down to the Riemann zeta of 4. And we also went a little bit in depth of calculating the Riemann zeta of 4 using the Fourier series of x to the power of 4. So of course, um, if you haven't seen that video, I'll leave that link in the description below or leave that attached into the annotations. But I also discussed that there was also several other methods on computing the, um, the Riemann zeta of 4 as the following. So you, for one is using x to the power of 4 of the Fourier series. Another one is using the Fourier series of x squared. Another one you can do is you could use the Riemann zeta to find out the even integers and using the sequence of Bernoulli numbers to evaluate that. Another one is using the Riemann zeta functions to find as a multiple integral, specifically if we have the bounds from 0 to 1 all the way up to 4 dimensions of uh, 1 divided by 1 minus x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, and x of 4, the x1 and then so on and so on, all the way to the 4th. Um, you can actually evaluate that from there. And another way, and this is actually what we're going to do for this video, is we're actually going to use the multiplication table to draw out the product, specifically for the Riemann zeta of 2 square. Use that as a multiplication table to write as the product for each. And what that comes down to is that all the entries for each of those products is actually the sum of the Riemann zeta 2, which of course, that will utilize our help to help evaluate the Riemann zeta of 4, which we know, but again, this is a proof. So this is actually where the fun comes in from using that multiplication table and also write it in a form that if you notice from that observation, which I'll write eventually, but I'll put that as a little, you know, disclaimer for up ahead that we're actually going to be using a bunch of properties with double sums and also using some um, product, some product series representation involved as well. So just a lot to take in from there, but I think personally, this is the most spectacular uh, proof, more elegant proof of showing the following right here. So with that, let's actually just jump right in. Okay, so just as created this table below, so I'm also going to cut the video eventually because it'll be a little bit tedious. But how does this work is that we're actually taking multiplications of both from the Riemann zeta of two values. So the product of these two will go into this entry, the products of these two will go into this entry, so on, so on, so on, filled in gaps. And this is, of course, going for infinitely many times since the Riemann zeta is an uh, infinite series. So I'm going to cut to the video, cut to the next clip to where I fill in the rest of the entries infinitely of so on, so forth. Okay, so now that we have all our entries, there's a reason why I have everything color-coded. So you notice the diagonals in the purple, everything up the upper triangular entries, they're in pink, and then everything in the lower triangular entries are orange. So you'll notice that we have the products for 1 over 1 square, 1 over 1 square, 2 squares, 2 square. Everything in the diagonals, if you take the sum of all those diagonal entries, this indeed by definition forms the Riemann zeta of 4 function. But everything with this product we start off, we have to add all the entries that is being created with the multiplication. So of course, with the Riemann zeta function being you know, an infinite series, that means infinitely many entries of those products. So what we can do is write this in terms of an infinite sum since it's the, the Riemann zeta 2 then. So to put it perspectively, I have the following. So this is Riemann zeta square. In other words, I have the infinite sum. So from i is equal to 1 of 1 divided by i squared. Sim simply, our i entries are actually coming from the our, our column. And then the j entries are coming from the, uh, row the row entries. And then now we actually do the multiplication yet again. So this is j is equal 1 of 1 divided by j squared. What's nice is that these are both absolutely convergent series and then I can actually combine this together to form a double sum. So the infinite sum starting with i is equal 1 and then another infinite sum here, j is equal 1, a double product, a double, a double sum series. So we have i squared then multiply by 1 divided by j squared. Again, as mentioned, this is a product of absolutely convergent series. Then we can, what we can do here is we can break this up a little bit easier so that we're taking two things to into account. This is the reason why I had this color coded. So this is what I'm gonna do. So you'll notice that we have to take all, add up all these entries. So infinitely many from both the row and then infinitely many on the column. So the column, row. So that means everything what I'm gonna write is the, the, the infinite sum for the diagonal entries. So that means the infinite sum 
for i is equal one of i divided by, or one divided by i to the power four. And then what's next is that we have the deal with everything of the upper and the lower triangular entries we're dealing with. So those are actually dealings with sums. And what that also means that we have to be careful on how we write our indices as well. So, so that means the next double sum I'll write, and that this is taking place for everything of the upper triangular um, entries, almost said matrices. So this is infinity of, i equals one and then now with the infinite sum over here infinity of j is equal to i plus one so we actually up the indices up there of one divided by i squared times one divided by j squared and so now this is coming from as mentioned everything from the upper entries over here so this is for j is strictly greater than i of the indices and then we add this now with the lower entry so now let me change this to an orange so now add this so basically it's just the same thing to accept the indices change so that means j is less than i so now we have our double sum now j is equal one and then next is the infinite sum now of i is equal to j plus one of one divided by i squared then times uh, one divided by j squared. And then we can actually fix this up a little bit because we can simplify these down even further that for one, this is by definition of the Riemann zeta evaluated at four. And these are basically the same thing. If you actually match the corresponding with each of the products together, you get the same value. So what that means is I can actually put this as double, so plus two times, and it doesn't matter which indices you write for what I'm about to write. So for now I have infinity, then this is gonna be, I'll write this as i is equal one and then the infinity, so j is equal to i plus one. Doesn't matter, you can write j is equal one and then i is equal j plus one, the indices matters, they're both the same. Again, this is why we write it as a double. So i squared and then one divided by j squared. So basically what we have right now is we are dealing with this following calculation that we need to evaluate. So what I'm gonna do now is of course, I'm gonna erase everything from here because we now get the gist on what we need to, we have a goal that we have to achieve that we want to do in order to get what we want. So let's actually get to that next step. Okay, so now after everything was erased, I we want to reiterate that so far that the product of the uh, Riemann zeta two square is equal to Riemann zeta of four plus two times the double sum i equals one, j is equal i plus one, infinity sum of one divided by i squared times one divided by j squared. So we have something we want to work around with since yet again, we want to solve or rather show that the Riemann zeta four is equal to pi uh, to the power of four divided by 90. So we're working with something here. Okay, so now with this, we just have to tackle that. So now let's suppose we actually, we're gonna let the following sequence or rather the product, we'll let p sub k, we're gonna let that be a finite product series. So we have x um, multiply with the finite product. So n is equal one all the way up to k of one subtract x squared, then divided by n squared times pi squared. This actually looks familiar, does it? This is actually Euler's um, infinite product, but except we're not taking it as k approaches infinity just yet. So we're dealing with just a finite you know, product series at the moment. We'll get to that step eventually. So if I were to expand this out, let's just expand it out just because, so because we want to analyze some things. So far that will be written as x times one minus x squared and divided by one square pi square, then multiply with one minus x squared divided by two square pi square, then you just keep going on so on so over all the way up to the k term. That's just one minus x squared divided by k squared then pi squared. Now let's actually, um, this is where the tedious part gets in because there are a bunch of observations we want to make with this uh, product series that we're dealing with. So we'll do things one at a time. So let's start with our p sub one series. So p sub one is just simple, just x then minus x cubed. And I'm actually jumping uh, another few steps ahead just for simplifying and This is actually very helpful, especially in the long run too. So x cubed divided by pi square of one divided by one square. Okay, so let's actually try um, p sub two. So p sub two is going to equal to x minus x cubed divided by pi square, then multiply with one divided by one square plus one divided by two square. Okay, and I'm gonna um, just move on to the next line. So plus x to the power five, then divided by pi to the power four. Again, this is actually a lot of expansions with multiplication, so that's why I'm just saving all the work here. So this is one, then divided by one square, multiplied with one divided by two square. It's a longer expansion, so why don't we actually um, try another one? Let's actually do p sub three. So this one's actually gonna be a long one. So p sub three is written as so x minus x cubed divided by pi squared, then we multiply with one divided by one square plus one divided by two square plus one divided by three square. 
Then next in the series expansion, we'll have plus x to the power five divided by pi to the power four multiply with one divided by one square times one divided by two square. Add this with one divided by one square plus one divided by three square plus one divided by two square times. Um, so that's supposed to be multiplied between over here, between the one square and the three square times. And then now plus one divided by two square times one divided by three square. Okay, and there's actually one more expansion left to go. So this one will yield us with minus x um, to the power seven divided by pi to the power six, and then, e and then multiply with one divided by one square times one divided by two square times one divided by three, or three square. Well, I don't know why I wrote a three cubed there for a sec. So the expansion can go really long and long and so forth. So I'm gonna write piece of four down, but I'm not actually gonna you know, say the whole thing. So I'll just cut to that next footage. So everything I just uh, listed out for a piece of four. So I'm gonna just put a dot, 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 so on and so forth for, you know, continue, ex and continue um, expansion, so on and so forth. So everything looks <laughs> crazy uh, for one, for piece of one is fine, piece of two is fine, but then piece of three and piece of four, and then you can guess all the way so on and so forth that the expansion gets pretty, pretty, pretty long. But we don't have to worry about that long expansion. The, the purpose is that those observations we don't we want to make specifically are mainly aimed towards the coefficients of our expansion. So what I'm going to do is, of course, now that you <laughs> gotten a good look at everything here, you feel free to pause if you want to read the numbers carefully, but we're going to move on to the next step and then make those um, observations of what we can um, conclude that everything we have witnessed so far. Okay, so after all that analysis, so here are some things we can actually draw some observations we can make. So firstly, the number of terms added to calculate the coefficient for of x cubed is equal to k choose one, in other words, simply just reduces to just k. Another one is that the number of terms added to calculate the coefficient of x to the power of five is equal to k choose two. And you could also, you know, go back and feel free to rewind to, you know, verify this yourself if you please to. The big one specifically, these last two, is we have that if for k is greater than or equal to one, the coefficient of x cubed of our p sub k product series is equal to negative one divided by pi squared multiply with the finite sum from i is equal one to k of one divided by i squared. And so the last um, observation is that for k is greater than or equal to two, the coefficient of x to the power of i of p sub k, that expansion is equal to one divided by pi to the power of four. Multiplied now we have our double sum. So we have i is equal to one to k minus one, and then j is equal to i plus one to k of one divided by i squared times one divided by j squared. So, uh, realistically speaking, the first two aren't as, um, it's interesting to note, but it won't really come as much in handy. It's mainly these last two. So because what that implies is we can actually do some substitution we can um, put back in. So, but actually before we get to that, well, actually not just yet, what we can do now is rewrite our piece of K. So P sub K now is that from that expansion that we've written as the product series. So now we can write that as the following. So I have X minus X cubed divided by pi square and then now multiply with the products um, or rather the partial sum of all the way up to k of i is equal to one of one divided by i square and then now add this with x to the power five divided by pi to the power four of now just substitute the double sum just over here so now we have the double sum that k minus one and i is equal one then another finite sum, this is going to up to k, and then j is equal to i plus one of one divided by i square, and then one divided by j square, and subtract, and then keep in mind, this actually alternates from here. But that's the least of our worries. We're actually mainly focusing on our x cubed and x to the power of five coefficient, so we don't have to worry about anything else there on there for. Now, we'll, now to the next step, we're actually gonna be using two representations. So now I actually mentioned this earlier. So sine of x can be written as Euler's um, infinite product series. So x and then multiplied by the infinite product of n is equal one of one subtract x square then divided by n square pi square and then the second one is we're using sine squared representation of the power series representation that's just equal to the infinite sum n is equal zero of the alternating so negative one to the power n then multiply with x 2n plus one and then divided by 2n plus one factorial. Now I can, let me expand this out a bit. So in other words, that's similar to writing x then minus x cubed divided by uh, three factorial. Add this with x to the power five, five factorial, and then subtract x to the power seven then divided by seven factorial, and then signs go on, so on and so forth. Okay, 
So now notice that our piece of K, if I were to take uh, as the limit approaches infinity, then we get exactly the um, Euler's infinite product series. Now, next thing to do is now let's actually, there's a reason why I have the power series representation because we have that nice little form over here, meaning I can actually equate the coefficients of x to the power of five from both the Euler's formula, uh, the product series representation, and the power series representation. So equate these two of x to the power of five together. So in other words, we'll write this as a limit, the limit as k approaches infinity of one divided by pi to the power of four, and then now multiply with our double sum, so k minus one and then j, or not j, i. i is equal one and then infinite sum, well, not, well, actually it's still partial, we're taking the limit. So now j is equal to i and then plus one of one divided by i square and then one divided by j square. So if I equate all this, so from the x to the power of five, so that means this is actually going to equal to one divided by five factorial. Now. Now take that limit as it approaches infinity, and what I'll do is I'll multiply a pi over pi to the power of four to both sides. So now, now we're dealing with infinite double um, double series. So i is equal one, and then infinite products or infinite sum. I keep saying product, so always get those mixed up. And then i is plus one of one divided by i square, and then one divided by j square. Simply just equal to pi to the power of four divided by five factorial. So now putting the act back together, so we started off with the Riemann zeta of two, quantity squares equal to the Riemann zeta of four, add this with two times our double sum, so infinity, then i is equal one, and then now infinity of the sum, so j is equal to i plus one of one divided by i square, and then one divided by j square. Now, what's nice is we actually just have what exactly we want, just plug this back in for the substitution. So in other words, I have that this is just the Riemann zeta of four, add this with two times pi to the power of four divided by five factorial. So now you, you see the observation, I'm gonna erase this side of the board and then we can continue forward with the substitution, rather the simplification. So reiterate just one more time, Riemann zeta two square is equal Riemann zeta of four. Then now this is just um, add this with, fix this. Uh, add this with two times pi to the power of four divided by five factorial. Then what I can do is I'll just subtract the, um, I'll subtract the two pi to the four, five factorial to both sides. So now we're actually left with just Riemann zeta four, which is what we want to calculate. And of course we know that Riemann zeta two is ba Basil's problem. So it's just pi squared divided by six, quantity squared, then subtract. So five factorial is what, 120? So that will reduce to pi to the power of four divided by 60. Then continuing forward with the simplification, so pi to the power of four divided by 36 minus pi to the power of four divided by 60. And we get a common denominator. So in other words, that's the same thing as five to the power of four divided by 180, subtract three pi to the power of four divided by 180. Simplify that even further to have two pi to the power of four divided by 180. Simplifying it down to finally just pi to the power of four divided by 90. Therefore, this completes the elegant proof that the Riemann zeta of four equals pi to the power of four divided by 90 with that whole multiplication table and double sums property and so on and so forth with all that just interesting stuff. So there you have it. So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.